Well, good morning. Good morning, good morning. You get to hear me some more, but I will not bust out in song, I promise. Okay, so uh, um, if you don't know who I am, I'm Matt Holloway. I'm the student ministries pastor here at Pathway. I also led worship this morning. If you didn't notice, you know, then that means you were late. So, so but um, it's, it's great to be, I get the opportunity to bring the word today, so, um, which I enjoy. And uh, my wife is over teaching in that preschool class over there because she's tired of hearing me preach. That's what she said this morning. No, just, just a joke, guys. She's, she's serving over there. There. Um, we have three boys. Uh, my wife's name is Courtney. We've been married since 2008, and we have three boys. And so I do a lot of wrestling in the house. You know, <laughs> I also coach wrestling in the winter, but that's different. All right? I do a lot at home, a lot of practice at home. But um, so yeah, this morning um, I get the opportunity to bring the word. So if you could turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter one, the book of Luke chapter one. Last week Scott started a series on the gospel of Luke. And um, he, if, you did, if you missed last week, if you missed last week's message, I really encourage you guys to go back on our website and you can watch the video from that and listen to that. Um, he just gave kind of an uh, introduction to what is the book of Luke. You know, there's four gospels that we call them, the good news are about Jesus. And this is one of those, what kind of sets Luke apart. And one of the things I wanna talk about, I mean, just, as we, just to make sure you know, is one of the things is that Luke was, yes, he was a guy who rubbed shoulders with the um, disciples in a Apostles. He is a disciple himself. When you look at kind of part two to Luke, which is the book of Acts, there's a lot of times he said, we did this and we did that. So he, he knew Paul, he knew all these guys. So he, he was involved in a lot of these things. He knew a lot of these guys, but he also, it also says um, in, in this first part, it says, he said, I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. So Luke went out and he talked to people. He, he talked to so-and-so who knew so-and-so who was there for this and that and, and got their experience. And he did that and he said, so that I could give an orderly account. So there could be an orderly account. He, he was a detail guy, all right? Luke is a doctor, is what it says. And so he was a detail kind of guy. He wanted to know, and here's the, the real reason though. He said, so that you, and he's talking to, to, to Theophilus, um, but he's also kind of talking to us as disciples. He says, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. So the gospel of Luke is about him investigating, getting the details, even up here, knowing everything so that we can be certain of the truth. We can know that what Jesus said is truth. What Jesus did is truth. All these things that happen are true. And so that's really what the gospel of Luke is about, is having these details so that we can feel certain and know that this is truth. And so today we are gonna talk about the first story that we see in uh, the book of Luke, which is a story about a man named Zechariah. Zechariah. And uh, so we're going to look, if you um, haven't found Luke chapter one, you're probably looking in the Old Testament. Look in the New Testament, okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, it's the third one. If you hit John, uh, you've gone too far. So go back one. And we are going to look at this passage together. And so I'm gonna actually go ahead and read this. I'm gonna read through this story. It's kind of a lot, but it's a, it's a story, so it's not um, like a lot of, a lot of um, teaching stuff. But um, I want you guys to kind of see the big picture of what we're talking about. So Luke chapter one, verse five says, in the time of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly vision of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regu uh, regulations blamelessly, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well along in years. When Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time of the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Verse 11, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Verse 18, Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be 
sure of this. I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. He just called his wife old. Ooh, not good, not a good thing. So the angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you um, this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home after his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for um, after this, she became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. She said, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In th these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Now, I want you to flip over our, to uh, verse 57, okay? So we're gonna kind of skip a little bit. Uh, Jason, next week, um, uh, we'll be talking about Mary a little bit and some of that story. But here's where we kind of pick up this story in verse 57. It says, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son, her neighbor, um, her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy and shared her joy. On the eighth day, they, took, uh, they came to circumcise the child and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to the father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loosed and he began to speak, praising God. The neighbors were all filled with awe and throughout the hill country of Judea, people were um, talking about all these things. Everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, well, uh, what then is this child going to be for the Lord's hand was with him. Would you join me as we pray over this word? Lord God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for the, this gospel, this good news. God, would you help us to be taught through this? And God, our hearts are open to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me start. Let me just tell you a little story of my life. When I was a kid, um, I my first, what I would call a big boy bike. You guys know what I'm talking about? I had this bike. I thought it was the coolest thing. It had these like shocks on it. And I, that was like a new thing then. I thought it was the coolest thing because you could like, you know, pop wheelies, which again, useless, but I thought it was cool. All right. I was probably, I don't even remember exactly, probably that, you know, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, somewhere in there that I, had, I got this, you know, bike. And uh, we lived in, actually, it's funny, we lived in the house that Pastor Scott lives in now. Um, he was creeping on us and moved in after. No, <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. We lived in that house and our, we had a babysitter. My mom was working at that point. And so you just went down to the end of the street, you drove down the hill and right there on the next street corner was our babysitter. And so one morning my mom had to be at work. So she was gonna let um, us just ride our bikes down there, okay? And at that time, there was no houses on the side street that you went down. Now it's full of houses and there was just a field over there. And I was a little kid, okay? And so I remember, I'm riding my bike and I remembered that like just a couple of days before that, I had seen somebody riding a dirt bike in that field which of course to me was like the coolest thing, you know? And so that morning, being a kid and not realizing it's a morning, like when people go to work, I thought, I wonder if he's over there. You know, like that, again, he wouldn't be. So, but I, so I turn the corner, I'm going on the hill and I start looking for um, that guy. And then all of a sudden, bam, something jumped out and knocked me off my bike. It was a mailbox. <laughs> I think it moved, no. I was looking this way, riding that way, and I'm talking face. I'm not talking like, oh, I bumped it and I kind of swerved, no. I just, all of a sudden, off the back of my bike, I hit the ground. My brother, of course, because he's an older brother, he was all the way down the hill, he wasn't even, and he hurt, hears me, he throws his bike down and, and realizes what's going on. My mom is leaving for work, all right? And so like, I, I fell off, I'm like, my lip is bleeding because it was a metal mailbox, and so I either hit the little thing you open with or the lid, something, split my lip, of course, skinned my elbows all up, I went flying off the back of my bike. So I ran home and just caught my mom as she's pulling the Bonneville out of the, you know, out of the, out of the driveway, and so she had to take care of all that, and I survived, okay, I made it. Um, and let's, let's just say, I was a little afraid of my bike after that. <laughs> Actually, I was a little too afraid. It took me a while to get back on it because those mailboxes, you gotta watch them. All right, um, but here's the thing. When I finally did get back on my bike, you know what I did? I watched where I was going. 
like probably to a paranoid point, right? Like I had learned that I need to watch where I'm going. And this morning, as we look at this story, and we're gonna look at a couple other stories that kind of fit into this, I want you to see what God is up to in, in things like this that happen, like in Zachariah's life, what he's really doing and some of these other things of what is the greater picture of what God is doing through all this as we read this. And so we just, we just read this. I wanna help you understand this, this story a little bit. So Zachariah and Elizabeth are good folks. They're both descendants of Aaron. He's a priest, he's the man of God. And, but they, have, they, have, they are old, okay? Um, I know Zachariah just said my wife is well along in years, but before that, Luke had already told us they were both old, okay? So, so he just left himself out of that. But they're both old. And so when I say that, it's not like when a kid or a teenager thinks someone's old, okay? That's different. Like every time someone guesses my age, it's like 20 years too much. Guys, I'm really young, all right? But I hang out with teenagers and they're all like, what are you, 45? Like, no, I'm 30. They just turned 30. It's all downhill, but no. Okay, so... They're all, it said, the way he said, says it is they are well along in years. I've seen another translation that said they are advanced in years. I feel like that's when we say seasoned saints. You know, like have you ever been called one of those? I'm sorry. It's just really the nice, it says the nice way of saying, sorry, you're older, okay? You're an older person, all right? And so that's what, these were old people, okay? This was like the thing of, I know now we kind of have this thought of like, um, when you hit 30, you should stop having kids or whatever. I don't, that's not exactly how it was then. And so when it said they were old, it's like, no, these were old folks. They're, they they haven't been able to have kids this whole time. And we see from the story, from what the angel says to them, that they had been praying for years to have kids. It wasn't like they just decided not to or like no big deal. Back then, it was a huge deal to not have kids, even more so than now, because it was this thing of like, that was the blessing of God. That was the heritage to have a son, you know, and have someone carry that on and the legacy and all that. And so they had been praying for years because the angel says, your prayers have been heard. That's one of the first things he said. Don't be afraid, your prayers have been heard. So they've probably been praying praying for years. And Zechariah, the priest, the man of God, was bitter and hard-hearted because of all these years of not seeing, he had lost his faith in God's faithfulness. And you, and you, see, you know that because, get the story here, He's on duty as a priest. They would serve a week at a time, two different weeks out of the year, and he's on duty. He's chosen to go in. He's, he's worshiping by burning at the altar of incense, and an angel appears to him, okay? I've, I don't know about you. I've never had an angel appear to me to tell me anything, okay, other than my wife. Woo. Okay. Hey, tell her I said that. No, I'm just kidding. So, hey, that was good, huh? I just slipped that in there. Um, husbands, take that one with you. Okay, so... I want, you to, I want you to get this. An angel appears to him. And of course he's afraid because it was this, this huge thing that's happening. He said, don't be afraid. And then the angel just goes into all this stuff. He's like, your prayers have been heard. Elizabeth's gonna have a son. And he goes into all these extra things that who, who this son's gonna be. He, he tells him what the name's gonna be. You don't have to have that conversation. He's like, it's John. And he's gonna be set apart and you're not gonna do this. And, and he's gonna be um, filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. And I want you to understand that was a big deal. The Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out like in Acts chapter two yet. So the Holy Spirit came on people for specific times. So he's telling them, this guy is special. He's gonna walk in the power of Elijah, one of the greatest prophets of all time. Okay, and he's like, he's gonna, and he's gonna prepare God's people for the Lord to come. And he's like, Ten, and, and Zachariah's response was, how do I know for sure this is gonna happen? Here's your sign, right? I mean, like, he literally, literally he, tells, he tells the angel, he's like, hey, um, can you give me a sign or a guarantee? And the angel's response was a good one. I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. He's like, hello, I am your sign. And so, and, and so we know that we kind of, it sounds ridiculous, right? It sounds like an angel appeared in front of you. How did you not? And that's why we know his heart was hard. He was a little bitter towards the Lord. This is the man of God. It says they were upright. They hadn't done anything wrong. All right, these are good, righteous people. And all these years, they've been praying and it's not been answered. And they let their heart get hard. And you know that because he couldn't hear it. An angel appeared to him and he still couldn't hear it. And the thing is, it sounds kind of ridiculous, but that is exactly what we all do when our heart is hardened towards God in some way. We just we can't, we can't go there because maybe that one time we thought and that other time we heard and it didn't happen. We just can't 
trust God. And so what did God do? He rebuked Zechariah. We see the angel saying, the angels just share what they have been told. I mean, that's, understand, it's God rebuked him. And he said, okay, because you haven't believed your obvious sign, he said, you will not be able to speak. And here's an interesting thing too. And he says, until all these, this has happened, okay, and if you, I, just, I just found this out this way, I've never really seen this, is he actually could not um, speak or hear. It says speak here, but if you look in the other part we just read, when it says they, um, they were gonna name him Zachariah, and mom said, no, it's John, it says they made gestures to Zachariah to try to figure out what he wanted to name. You don't, if somebody can hear it, you just say, hey, dude, what do you wanna name your kid? And then he grabs the, they said they're making gestures to try to say, hey, what do you want his name to be? You know, whatever, and they, and I'm not sure what this was, but it would apparently be on his forehead. So anyway, so he could not, and, and yet until all this has happened, and we see it happen. We're talking, look, she hadn't gotten pregnant yet. It says after he gets, so he's on duty, okay? Um, and so it's at least a week. I don't know when in the week uh, this happened. So let's, you know, it's another few days. He goes home and, is, and has to try to explain this to his wife and he can't speak or hear. And she's all like, Whew, that's good. But also, I mean, I understand. He had to go home and tell her and then he had to convince his wife that they should, mm-hmm, and then, and hey, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, he can't speak or hear. That probably at least took a week, you know, to get that figured out, right? And so then it says she gets pregnant. And then, and as we just learned that Jason just learned this morning, 40 weeks, right, is a, is a pregnancy, which is closer to 10 months, okay, when you kind of do it on a calendar. Okay, I know we always say nine, but it's closer to that. And so um, it's all that time. And then John's born, the baby's born. And then when they take him a week later, to be circumcised, that's when they name him. And it wasn't until everything was fulfilled, and that could be a message in itself, until everything happened, not just John was born, they named him John as soon as that happened. All this, that's another week. Guys, we're talking almost a year, okay? Almost a year, he cannot speak or hear anything. 10 months, or 11 months, whatever it was, inside his own head. Can you imagine? I mean, we've, we, We've all been through hard things, but can you imagine 10 months of God saying, nope, you cannot speak. Or 10 months, he, God trapped him inside his own head. Why would God do that? I mean, all he did was he had some doubt after, you know, probably what? what I mean, I don't know how old he was, but what, 60 years old? I mean, some old, 70, 80, 90, I don't know how old he is. It's years that long of, he was a little hardened towards the Lord. And when the, why would God do that? Why was God, was God punishing him just because he was mad at the disrespect? Was he disciplining him? Isn't that the same thing? How many of you guys have kids in the room? How many have kids? Raise your hand. You claim them, it's okay. Some of them aren't in here, so it's fine. All right, so what is, I just think about it. What is disciplining your kids about? And I know if I asked the kids in the room, almost all of them would say, punishment, they're trying to punish me. And yes, you would say it like that. Sometimes you guys are kind of whiny, okay? And you need to, <laughs> all right? So look, you guys would all say, oh, it's about punishment, it's about punishment. It's like, no, every parent here should know. Disciplining your kids is not about punishment, right? It's about training, right? It's about, it's, it's kind of that necessary action that's often, often uncomfortable for both. I mean, that that teaches them how they should and should not live or how, what they should do and what they should not do. It's about training them to be who they should be, right? And act how they should act. That's what disciplining our kids is about. So what's, what's my point? Here's, here's kind of what, here's the principle we see in this story. What I wanna talk about this morning is, and it's, it's a tough one, okay? But God's rebukes, God's discipline, our hardships that we go through are used by God to take us where he needs us to be in here, in our heart. That's what God's rebukes and all the discipline and the training and the hard stuff we go through, that's what it's about. And that can be a hard point because we're talking about the hard things in our life, like not being able to speak or hear for 10 months. Look, Zachariah was told that he was gonna have a son named John and he was gonna have 
Um, that all the things that John was gonna be that we just read, and the power of Elijah, and he's gonna prepare the way for the Lord. And that's the majority of what the angel came to tell him, okay? It was a big deal that he said, hey, you're gonna have a son. But he probably could have figured that out on his own if, if him and his wife, you know, knew what they had to do. And then, and then she got pregnant, and it's like, he would have figured that out. And he would have said, oh man, God has blessed me. But he came to tell him who he's gonna be, and he tells him all that, and he couldn't get past the first statement, all he heard was, he can, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. His response was to that first statement. How do you know this is gonna happen? My wife is old, remember? He said, call his wife old, remember? It's like, he said, how do you know? That wasn't, he's like, how do you know he's really gonna prepare the way of God? He didn't, he didn't question him on that. He couldn't get past the first statement. That's, his heart wasn't there. He couldn't focus on what God wanted him to see and hear he couldn't get past that first statement. His heart was a few steps behind where it needed to be. His, his heart was stuck. He wasn't ready for what he needed to be ready for. And so he was disciplined, he was rebuked. He was put inside his own head for a 10 months to think about it. And then what happened? We look at verse 67, which we didn't read, it was right after this. As he's born, his mouth is open. It already said he started praising God. And then verse 67 says, his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. And again, that was a big deal when the Holy Spirit came on someone. He began to prophesy. And then in all the things he says, and we won't read this whole thing, but he starts just praising God, praise be to the Lord and all. The, and then in, down in verse 76, he says, and you, my child, will be called the prophet of the most high for you will go before the Lord and all the things that John was gonna be and even more detailed than the, than the angel had first told him. And he just begins to prophesy and believe those things over his son, John, exactly what he couldn't hear almost a year earlier from the angel. But now his heart was where it needed to be. After that t hardship, after that hard time, God was able to line his heart up and now he was ready to do what God needed him to do, which was raise John, to be who God had called him to be. As God has a purpose in what he does and it's always to move you closer to him by whatever means necessary. God is always purposeful in his rebukes and in his discipline to you. Okay, it always has perfect purpose and it's to move our heart closer to his. And, e and even when we are rebuked because of the wounds are self-inflicted, okay? And so keep your, keep your uh, spot here in Luke chapter one. I want you to turn to uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11. We're gonna look at 11 and 12. Go ahead and flip over there. If you don't have a, a Bible with you, you should bring it with you because this is church, Okay. Um, and if you don't have them, we'll give you one. We have them at the Welcome Center. But um, if you don't use your phone, that's fine. Just don't be doing other stuff on it um, because, hey, I'm a youth pastor. I'm used to saying that every week. So, all right. So, but here's what I want. I want you to see this principle. So we're gonna jump a couple places here. I wanna talk about some other stories. But in this first one, they were good people. They, they did, you know, they didn't, but they allowed themselves to get hard from, from God's timing, right? And so it was kind of their fault, but at the same time, you kind of understand where they're coming from. And then sometimes we just mess up. And so we're gonna talk about David and Bathsheba and Nathan, okay? And this is one of those stories that you read chapter 11. Most of us know the story of David and Bathsheba at least a little bit, but there, you have to read chapter 12 to see really how it, how it ended when Nathan comes to him. And so we're gonna talk about this. And it says in verse one, it says, in the springtime at the, at the time when kings went off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army, and he stayed home. Guys, let me just throw this out there. Be where you're supposed to be. Don't shirk your responsibilities. I'm just telling you, the, 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 his biggest mistake in this was it said when the springtime when king, and whoever's writing this, I love it because they don't pull any punches. They're like, in the king time, you, or the springtime when, you know, when kings go off to war, David sent someone else to do his job for him and he stayed home and was lazy. So I'm just, let me just throw that in there. Be where you're supposed to be, okay? Don't shirk your responsibilities. Don't be lazy, okay? And so here, let me, I'm not gonna read this whole thing. I'll just kind of, I'll tell you what happened. So then, then one evening, well, remember, he's supposed to be off the war. He's bored because he's not doing what he's supposed to do. And he, he starts walking on the roof and he spots a naked woman, all right? It, I'm sure it was naked. You're supposed to say naked when it's, when it's a surprise, ah, you know? So, which it probably wasn't a surprise. He said she was bathing on the roof. He probably knew where the baths were and that he could see from the palace. But anyway, so he's walking, he spots this woman bathing. And then he says, he sends someone to find out about her, to see who it is. And I love this because his servant that comes tries to help him out. He tries and he said, hey, 
uh, yeah, isn't that Bathsheba? You know, Uriah the Hittite's wife? And he says that, and sometimes we like, he, we think he's like, oh, isn't that, I think that's who it is. No, he was trying to help old David out and say, hey, you, isn't that Bathsheba, you know, Uriah the Hittite? Because David knew who Uriah was. Have you ever heard of David's mighty men or anything like that? If you read at the end of 2 Samuel, you'll see like these nicknames of like these elite forces, that these incredible warriors, like the three, they called them the three because there were these guys that like one of them killed 800 people himself. I mean, just these, you know, some of them like on their own defended the line. I mean, just crazy. And then there's a fourth guy who ended up leading them. He's not part of the three, but he was, I don't know, it's, it's confusing. But then there was these, the 30, okay? And they were said there's about 37 of them. They called them the 30, and these were another other incredible warriors they had. I was saying, these are like the guys, if you want something done, you send the three for sure, or you send the 30 to do this job. And you read that whole list, the last one they name, Uriah the Hittite. I, I'm just saying, the king didn't know everybody in the army. But if there was guys that had these nicknames and these reputations, the 30, he probably knew who the 30 were at least a little bit. He knew, who, he knew, knew of them, right? He, he probably knew, you know, he definitely knew the three. He knew who these guys were. And so he's kind of saying, hey, don't, isn't that Uriah the Hittite's wife? And he ignores it and he doesn't listen to his, he sends somebody to send, send her to the palace. He, 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 he brings her there, sleeps with her, sends her back home. And she then gives word that she's pregnant. David freaks out, okay? Because Uriah is off to war where David should be, all right? And so he sends to Joab, he says, hey, send me Uriah the Hittite. He gets there and he starts to just fake like he was like, hey, tell me what's going on. How's Joab? How's the front line? What's going on? And then he says, hey, thanks for the update. Why don't you go home and wash your feet or whatever? He's really saying, hey, you haven't seen your wife in a long time. Why don't you go home? I know it'll happen, okay? And so he, he, he says that, and Uriah, this is an awesome dude too, poor Uriah, I'm telling you. He, he goes and he sleeps out at the, at the entrance with all the servants, where all the servants did. He sleeps there and he finds out, David finds out he didn't go home and he said, why didn't you go home? I got you, and he said, man, he said, Israel is out in the, and sleeping under tents. He said, the Ark of the Covenant is out there. He said, uh, the, the men of Israel are just sleeping on the, in the open fields. He's like, there's no way I could go home. And he even says, there's no way I could go home and sleep with my wife and rest of my, he's like, there's no way. And so David said, okay, stay here one more day and I'll send you back. And really it was like attempt number two now. And, he's, and he, get, he invites him to eat with him, gets him drunk and thinks when he's drunk, he'll just walk home and he'll sleep with his wife. Still, even in his drunkenness, he sleeps with the servants outside. He won't do it because he's just so faithful. He's like, I'm not gonna do it. If they can't, I'm not gonna because Israel's to war. And so then David writes a note to Joab and says, hey, you're right. He seals it, gives it to Uriah. And the note says, put Uriah where the fighting's the fiercest, right on the front line. And if you have to pull the line back so he dies. And he hands it to Uriah and sends his own death note with him, sends him back there. Of course, he, he's killed all right, he's killed on the front line, sends word back. After the mourning period is over, he takes Bathsheba and he marries her and she has a son, okay? And that's chapter 11. But right at the end of this, it says she bore him a son, but the thing David had done displeased the Lord. And he kind of, he brushed everything under. There's some servants that knew some things. They weren't gonna say anything. They're gonna lose their head because the king, you know, he's the king. And so, but the Lord sent Nathan to David. This is why you have to, you have to read the rest of this even. And he sends Nathan to him and Nathan tells the king a story. Now, Nathan would have come, the prophet, he's the prophet of God. He would have came and he would have been in the throne room. Okay, there's servants around, there's people around and he starts to tell him a story. And he says, there's two, two men in the same village. One's a rich man and one's a poor man. And he says, the rich man has so many flocks and, um, and, and so, much, so many herds. He's just got so many things. And then there's this one poor man who has this little ewe lamb and he loves it. And he, it's part of the family. It's their pet, right? He's like, he, he, they, eat, they eat with them. He cuddles it at night. And before you judge him, some of you guys have cats, okay? And I'm just tell you right now, this lamb was probably nicer than your cats are. Let's be honest, okay? So don't judge him, all right? So this guy is all he has. So it's, it's a pet to them, okay? It's not even like just something they're raising to, it's a pet. And it says, then a traveler came to the rich man. And it says, he, he says, a traveler came and he said, instead of taking one, just one from his herds of just thousands, he takes the, the, the little baby lamb, the pet lamb from the poor man and he serves that to his, to his guest. 
And David, it says in verse five, David burned with anger against the, the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. He must pay for the lamb four times over. And then Nathan says, you're the man. And he just begins to download from God. He says, you're the one. He said, God gave you all, your, he gave you Saul's kingdom and all of his wives and all, all this power. And he said, and God even says to him, he says, if it wasn't enough, I would have given you more. He says, but you took this, the wife from this other man, the one thing he had, you took it for your own instead. And then he just begins to tell him all the consequences that are coming. He said, you killed them with the sword of the Amorites that you were fighting. He said, I know you didn't do it yourself, but you know, therefore you will always be fighting in wars. There will be no peace anymore for your kingdom. He says, that's gonna, gonna happen. He said, you took somebody's wife in private. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have people take yours and everyone's gonna know about it. And he just, boom, he just starts to hit him with all this stuff. And it just cuts David and then, and he talks about even his sin and then, and then the, the big, one of the biggest things, he said, that son that you just had through that adulterous affair, he said, it's gonna die. And so David had to walk through all that, watch this son die. But here, turn over to Psalm 51. Turn over to Psalm 51. I want you to really see what God was doing. Because we see like, man, God's coming down. We're like, hey, he deserves it. But even in, even in his rebuke of something that was a horrible sin, a sin that he covered up with another sin and another one, I mean, he just piled it on. I want you to see what God even did, even though he deserved, he, and he still had to deal with all those consequences, but what he did in, in Psalm 51, if, in the label of this psalm, it says, for the director of music, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. All right, this is what, this is the song that David wrote about the rebuke from Nathan. He said, have mercy on me, all this stuff. But look at verse six. He said, surely you, God, desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. In verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Verse 16 says, you do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God those are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not be displeased with those. And he had gone through, he, he'd gone through the motions of the whole, you know, doing the worship, how he had to, doing the offerings. And it, through this rebuke of something horrible that he should have never done, but God, even through our mistakes, God's heart is to help us have a better relationship with him and to have a heart that is where it needs to be even through something horrible that he brought on himself, God was to still say, your heart was in the wrong place. You were going through the motions of worshiping God, but it really, it needs to be in here. And, and that's the message from God that David received. He was gonna have to deal with the child still dying. He still had to deal with, um, from his own household, people taking his wives. And all, if you read on, you'll see all that stuff happened. Okay, he still had to deal with all that. But, but God changed his heart. God changed his heart through that. I mean, if you, uh, you don't have to turn back there, but in 2 Samuel 12, 13, after he pours out some of these, before he even told them that the child was gonna die, he just tells them all this stuff. And David, it, it, it says, then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not gonna die. He's not gonna strike you down. But, and he goes into some of the other things he's gonna have to deal with. Guys, God takes away your sin. And let me just take a moment to say, if you, have, if you have messed up and you've done something horrible and you feel like, man, God's coming down on you, God, I want you to understand, God takes away your sin. Jesus' grace is more than sufficient for what, you're gonna, what you could do to sin against God. And that's what he, he, was, he was, David was fearing for his own life at that point. Nathan knew. He's like, God's gonna strike me down. I've sinned against God. And he said, no, no, no. He said, God's taken, God's taken away your sin. God's taken that away. And, and it's just that, this heart of like, no, 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 God has something greater he wants to do in you to get you to a new place. The things that follow, even in your sin, the things that follow, the consequences, those are not for your past. God doesn't punish you um, like we think about it, like you did this wrong and I'm just gonna come down and you have to deal with it. Because No, the things that come are, are, are for your future. They're for... The, the things that we go through, they're for you to be different than when you messed up. He, he, he was more concerned about David's future. Yes, it was a horrible thing. And yeah, he had to deal with a lot because of it. Whenever you, you know, commit adultery and then get the husband killed to, to try to cover it up. Yeah, 
that, there's a lot of you're, a consequences you're gonna have to deal with. And God did come down on him, but it was so that after this, he wouldn't have his heart in that same place again. When, the, when he's supposed to be out to war, he'd be out there. When he sees that Tim's he's like, I'm not doing that again. Because my heart is in a different place. It's humbled before the Lord. And the last thing I, I wanna talk about though is, is what, about, what about the hard times we don't ask for? You know, you see this first one in Zechariah. He, he didn't ask that Elizabeth would be barren, but he, he let his heart get hard. You know, so it's kind of that in between. And you have David who just royally messed up. Um, and he's like, of course, he's gonna, it, God's gonna come down. Well, what about those times that are really hard? And well, I, didn't, I didn't ask for this. And so I want you to flip back to Luke. The last place I'm gonna have you flip. Um, chapter 22. And I want you to look at chapter 22. I mean, we'll hit this um, during this series, but I figure it's probably gonna be a good year from now, so you'll probably forget it. it's fine. So, so we'll get there again. It's chapter 22, we're in chapter one. So, okay. So this is at the Last Supper, and there's a moment where um, we're, gonna look, we're gonna look here at verse 31 and 32, and there's a moment when Jesus takes Simon, Peter, as we would know him as, to the side. Peter was his nickname, all right? It meant rock. Like he had that nickname long before Dwayne Johnson. I mean, he was like, Jesus gave him that. Jesus is the coolest nickname guy ever. He's like, here's the son, sons of thunder over here and here's the rock or whatever. And so, but in this moment, he uses not his nickname because there's other times he called him rock. I mean, that's what he called him, Rocky, you know? And he, he says, Simon, I love it. He, this is like a serious moment because he says his name twice in the beginning. And he even says it a third time in the same sentence later. I mean, he's just like, it's a real moment. He pulls Peter aside and he says, Simon, Simon, listen to me. He said, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But, and a lot of us would expect to hear, but I told Satan to get out of here in the name of me, don't you go, you know, whatever. I'm being Jesus, that was a joke, not in the name of me, but you know. That's what we, like whenever Satan's involved, we're like, hey, you have no authority. No, Satan doesn't have any authority. He never does. But he, God can allow him to do some things, just like he did with Job. Satan had to come and ask, and he said, okay, you can do that. I'll show you how he responds. And he does that, but that's not what he says. He, he says, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith would not fail. Jesus just pulled the, I'm praying for you. He just, he just pulled him aside, like serious moment, guys. Simon, Simon, listen to me. He said, Satan has come. He's gonna, he's gonna bring the house on you. He's gonna hurt you, but I pray for you. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's what, I'm like What? Like, that is not what you expect Jesus to say, right? He said, you're gonna go through a really hard, the hardest time of your life. Satan's gonna come and just bring the house in. He's, but I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. Why? Why would he say that? Verse 32, the second part says, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Like, there was purpose in allowing that hard time. And this is, this is the part that's the hardest of any of these is when we, I go through something and it's so hard and I'm not making light of what you're going through. What he went through is tough too. This is the whole thing of he was gonna, he, he, he was gonna deny Jesus and feel that guilt and he was gonna go back and have, be purposeless because he left Jesus and he, was gonna, he, he kind of gets reinstated. But guys, that's what even the analogy of sifting wheat is about. When you sift wheat, you're, taking the, um, you're trying to get the edible grain out of the useless parts the chaff, you, you try to take, because that's useless and you try to get to the good stuff inside. That's what he told me he's gonna do. So Satan's gonna come and he's going to do my work in taking off that useless stuff so that only the good stuff remains. Guys, God is in the business of transforming lives. And that means it completely changes from one part to another. And how did it turn out for Peter? Acts 2, 14, right after the Holy Spirit comes down and they're filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them and all the people heard and all this crowd, they're like, what is going on? And it says in 14, then Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. And he just begins to tell them who Jesus was. And this is the same guy who denied him, went through that whole hard time that God allowed him to go through. And then verse 41, right at the end, it says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Whew, that's a good message right there. 3,000 people came to know Jesus that one day. I'd say it worked out. I'd say it worked out for Peter. I mean, guys, God has a greater view than we could see. And you guys, he has a greater plan than we could ever put together for ourselves. And it's, it's hard, and this is a hard 
message is a hard thing to say, but this principle, no matter what the thing that God allows us to go through, whether it's a direct rebuke for something we've done or where we've let our heart get or whether we're going through something really hard that we just can't understand and it seems unfair, just like for Peter, I mean, one of the leaders of the disciples, it just seemed unfair. Like, no, he's like, trust me, you need to go through this because when you come back, you're gonna be way stronger and I need you to be the guy who stands up and addresses the crowd. Is not afraid to speak about me because you have some of that in there. I might take that out because I'm gonna test you here and it's gonna, it's gonna wreck your heart and then I'm gonna bring you back. So how does Zachariah's story end, really end? You know, he, pray, he, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to prophesy, he began to believe that. But in verse 80, the last one in chapter one, it says, and the child grew and became strong in the spirit and he lived in the desert until he appeared publicly to Israel. It's John the Baptist. It's the guy who prepared the way for Jesus. Said, Understand, God prepared Zechariah so that he could raise a son that would prepare the way for the son. That was what he needed from Zechariah. He didn't just, he didn't ju- I mean, yeah, he answered the prayer. I mean, well, understand what God does. He's like, yeah, I heard your prayers, but I'll do you a whole lot better. Is that, you're gonna have a son. He's gonna, have, he's gonna take on your lineage. But oh, no, no, I got much more for him. He's gonna do all this. And then when God took him through that and it changed Zachariah's heart and then he began to really believe what God had told him about, not only that he would have a son because he already saw that part, but that who he was gonna be. And then it says, man, he grew and became strong in the spirit and he did exactly what God had prepared him to do because Zachariah's heart was where it needed to be and it wasn't 10, 11 months earlier. You know, when I was learning to ride my bike on my own, I'm sure my parents told me to watch where I was going. I don't remember it because I was a kid, but <laughs> I, mean, I probably didn't hear it, but they, I'm sure, I'm sure my parents were like, you have to watch where you're going, man, because I was kind of that kid that was like, oh, what's over there, you know, let's talk, or whatever, you know. Um, and I'm sure they taught me that. I'm sure they told me that. But how did I really learn what was the right thing to do? A split lip, right? That's how I, I mean, I, when I hit the face of the mailbox, I remembered I got to look where I'm going. But, but what's the good part of the story, of that bike story, is, is I, I learned what I needed to in order to do what I needed to do on my bike, even if it was the hard way. And guys, in our relationship with God, God takes you through what he needs to take us through so that in order for us to be who he needs us to be. Get that? God takes us through what he needs to take us through in order for us to be who he needs us to be. There is always, always purpose in what God does. There's always purpose. This is exactly why in, in the book of James, when we talk about how he said to be joyous in trials of many kinds in verses two through four in chapter one, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature, complete, not lacking anything. He didn't say consider it joy because we should be those people who are like, oh, I'm just so happy in my trial. No, that's not what he's, he's saying. You, you should consider it joy because God is doing something in you so that he can do something greater through you. And he doesn't, we, in our hard times, if we're honest, what we usually pray is like, God, take, get me through this. And God doesn't wanna just get you through it. He wants to make you better for it. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't strike Zachariah's speech and hearing away just because he's like, how, I'll show you who's, I mean, he did a little bit to get the humble heart, but it was, it was like, it was for that reason. There was a purpose behind that. And I just wanna encourage you guys with whatever you're going through, know that God has purpose in your life. Guys, this story of Zechariah is really a story about faithfulness. It's a story though about God's faithfulness in you. It's not just a story about somebody who lost their faith and needed to have it. It's a story about what God does through you, even through those hard times and how he changes your heart. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Would you pray with me? Worshiping.